So I am Tom Lean, I'm an historian of technology and author of Electronic Dreams, which is a book about the history of the British home computing boom. And this is an absolutely awesome location to talk about the British home computing boom in. I mean, Cambridge was home to so many British computer companies that helped shape the computer boom. And this museum itself, which actually features in my book, is, I think, a fantastic testament to so many of the machines of that time. So what's Electronic Dreams actually about? It's about how Britain learned to love the home computer. And the story goes something like this. At the start of the 1980s, Britain was swept by a new craze as the whole country went mad for home computers. Before this, very few people outside a few geeks and enthusiasts actually had computers at home. And to many people, they would have been futuristic and fantastic machines. Huge, expensive electronic brains for big science, big business and big brother. How huge and expensive? Well, for a long time, the very idea of having a computer at home was basically science fiction. And there is no better example of this than this wonderful advert from the 1960s, when the American retailer Neiman Marcus made a brief attempt to sell a computer for the home. This is the Honeywell Kitchen Computer, yours for around $10,000, which is roughly the price of a house at this time in America, and is useful for little more than storing recipes. It is advertised with the wondrous slogan, if only she could cook as well as Honeywell can compute. Computing's gender problems do go back a long way. Um, needless to say, this machine didn't get very far. There is, in fact, no record of it being sold at all. And it wasn't... I'm somewhat relieved, actually. I mean, as a feminist, I am relieved. It wasn't until the late 1970s, when smaller and cheaper microcomputers began to appear, that the fantasy, and I think that's really what it is before this time, the fantasy of having a personal computer of your own became a reality. And it's only really in the early 1980s that they really took off as home appliances. As home computers like this ZX Spectrum here, the Acorn BBC Micros that you will see elsewhere in this room, the Amstrad CPC, the Commodore 64, and dozens and dozens of other designs, the sort of machines that this computer museum is full of, made it possible for millions of people to try out computing for the first time. In 1983, Britain boasted the highest level of computer ownership in the whole world. Shops sold out of computers at Christmas. Britain had a computer industry to be proud of, much of it actually based in Cambridge, with companies like Sinclair, Dragon, Oric, Jupiter Cantab, Camputers, not to mention the likes of Memotech, Oric, familiar names at the time, but companies that have long gone, started making computers and exporting them around the world. Now, from where we are today, it's a little hard to see what all the fuss was about in the early 1980s, I think. We live in a world where computers are everywhere. Why were people so excited about them? And I think to understand that, you have to understand a little bit more about computers before the 1980s. And that really begins for me in 1948 in Manchester. Now, historians of computing have spent an awful lot of time arguing about very obscure technical details to try and answer the question of what the first computer was. For my money, the first machine that really shares the architecture of a computer like the one on your desk was the 1948 Manchester Baby, which was a ton of primitive electronics cobbled together on racks by a bunch of former wartime radar designers. Fascinating fact of the night, this machine, which you can see a slightly later version of here, used a cathode ray tube. That's basically a television tube to store its programs in. And it was so crude, the electronics, all it could actually do was subtract. So if they wanted to add up numbers, they had to take away negative numbers. I mean, it really is that simple. Cambridge University, interestingly enough, had the world's second computer. So bad luck there, Cambridge. You were a little bit late in the shape of the EDSAC from 1949. A few years ago, though, I had the great pleasure of interviewing Jeff Tootill, who was the last survivor of the team that built the Manchester Baby in the 1940s. And we got talking a bit about you know, that very first day in summer of 1948, when they got this thing working. And I was expecting to hear this sort of fascinating story, this exciting tale of switching the machine on and, and sitting there and watching it spring to life. You know, the sort of dawn of the computer age in this little green screen you can see in the middle here. And I was a bit taken aback when he told me that what they actually did was, well, we got switched it on, we congratulated ourselves it worked, then we went for lunch. <laughs> like we normally did anyway. Um, I then did that thing you're not really supposed to do as an oral historian, ask loads of probing questions to try, but it must have been more exciting than that, Jeff, it must have been. It's a very sort of low moment in many senses. There's no press conference, there's no camp champagne, they didn't even take a photograph. 
This one was taken a year later of the machine grown into something rather different. And why is this? Because at the time, back in the 1940s, nobody really expected to computers to change the world. At the time, Jeff told me they were expecting perhaps another two or three computers in Britain for things like atomic energy calculations and trying to work out what the weather was going to do. And that was going to be the scope of their invention. Except maybe in the US where they may have as many as six because Jeff assured me they always had big ideas and I think history has proved that to be the case. So at the time, back in the 1940s, computers, they're really sort of thought of as big machines for scientists. Electronic brains, giant machines that you can use for searching for large prime numbers, but not much else. But of course, it doesn't stay that way. Hilarious 1950s advertising coming up. In the early 1950s, governments and businesses start getting used to the idea that computers could be beneficial. They can start doing things like payroll and stock control. And one of the really earliest examples of this is, in part, a Cambridge story. The machine you can see in this cover here is the Loins Electronic Office, the LEO computer, developed not, strictly speaking, by a computer company, but by J. Lyons Limited, best known for running a nationwide chain of tea and cake shops. It's actually partly a sort of productionized version of the Cambridge University EDSAC as well, but that's a slightly different story. But if you read through the old newspaper stories about Leo at the time, one of the things that really stands out in the press is that they really can't take the idea of anybody using a computer in the office seriously. They call it the tea shop brain, and they start writing these wonderfully twee stories about how, well, what are they going to use this for, this, this tea shop brain? Ha ha, I bet it's going to be used to calculate how many miles of Swiss roll they're going to need in the school holidays or count the number of beans on toast. But gradually, we sort of see this image of the computer as being something twee and not very serious change. Gradually, these light-hearted stories become a bit more serious as computers do start getting used by businesses and governments in large numbers. And people start realising that there are threats here, as well as amusing pictures of lions being walked by businessmen. Science fiction writers, for instance, develop a deep love about writing about computers going horribly wrong and taking over the world. Other people start to worry about data banks creating a big brother society, and that term really does go back to the 1960s. It's really interesting. People start worrying as well about computers and robots taking all our jobs. Um, the newspapers today are full of these stories about computers and robots taking all their jobs, but I'd like to read you a short extract from the Daily Mirror in 1955, which warned of a do looming robot revolution with the words, everyone knows what an electronic brain is. It's a machine that plays drafts. However, it also goes in for other activities. It's a member of a growing family of robots that can do anything. Bake pies, make motors, answer the telephone. They can fashion jig borers, add up, subtract, divide. They can write, they can speak, they can pen love letters. They can do all of these things without any help from you. Whatever your job is, the chances are one of these machines can do it faster or better than you can. And I think it's incredible that you could open up a newspaper today and read roughly the same story. These stories go, do go back a long way. And yet, more than anything else in the past, I think, computers were unfamiliar. They were misunderstood, strange, just things that people aren't really used to. Most people never have actually seen one. If you think back to actually being a computer user in the past, you would probably turn up at sort of a computer data installation, hand over a bunch of punched cards, and then return a little while later to collect a bunch of printouts. You know, it's kind of this magic brain they're keeping in a room away from you. But all that really does begin to change in the 1970s, when developments in miniaturized microelectronics and the invention of the microprocessor in particular effectively shrink all that complex circuitry you need to build a computer down to the size of a few tiny microchips. And these developments in microchips really catch wider attention towards the end of the 1970s, when experts, the media, and the government suddenly declare that the world is on the brink of an information technology that is going to, sorry, an information technology revolution which is going to change absolutely everything. Microchip-powered computers were far cheaper than anything that had really been built before. So cheap, in fact, that there's this sudden realization that miniaturized computers could be absolutely everywhere, doing all sorts of interesting things. We might have cool electronic gizmos in our home, like doorbells that tell us who's at the door. <laughs> Word processors will replace secretaries. Data banks will replace filing clerks, computers will cheat children, diagnose you at the doctors, and robots will make factory workers redundant. 
Traditional jobs were basically expected to disappear at an incredible rate, and the world was never going to be the same again. I'd like to quote you again from the Daily Mirror, this time in 1978, which apparently is taking the same line as in 1955. The microchip, according to the Daily Mirror, can do almost everything from painting a chair to building a Concorde. Without men, it's more revolutionary than the wheels. It will make millions of jobs unnecessary. And yet for those people who I think are far more interested in new technology, the argument was at the time that these people who actually understand technology, who will be able to tame this incredible new thing, there will be fantastic opportunities with new sorts of high-tech jobs and opportunities for working smarter, not harder. The expectation was at the end of the 1970s, we'd all be working sort of 20-hour weeks and there were going to be riots because people had so much free time on their hands. Um, that hasn't quite happened yet. But for those who actually didn't grasp this new technology, the world was going to leave them behind. The idea really is of a world on the brink of an industrial revolution powered by microchips. Or as the Times put it, understanding the wonder chip of the 1980s will be as vital as understanding of steam and iron was to our Victorian forefathers. But as all this media hoo-ha is brewing, electronics hobbyists, the sorts of people who enjoy building their own radio sets or stereos and such like, get excited and enthused by the microchip. And rather than being scared of it, they start playing around with this technology and seeing what it can do, cobbling together the world's first personal computers effectively from scratch, sometimes from building kits at a slightly later stage. Um, the machine you can see here is the Altair, which is generally regarded as the machine that gets personal computing going. First sold as America in a kit for about $400 in 1975, it looks a bit like a box with some switches and some lights on. And in fact, it is a box with some switches and some lights on. You flick the switches in to enter your program and the lights flash back whatever the result is. And that's pretty much what it does. Unless, of course, you're an electronics genius, in which case you can build other things to actually expand it. But I think this and machines like it, they're about computing for computing's sake. This is a technical hobby for people who like logic and they can understand things like binary and hexadecimal and they can solder things without setting fire to themselves, which is more than I can do. But as the 1970s go on, several similar machines to the Altair appear, um, notably this little device at the top, which is a Science of Cambridge MK14, later somewhat more famous as, I guess, Sinclair's first computer. This thing's just £40 in the late 1970s. But as you can see, it's far too complicated for the mass market. I mean, why would anyone want one of these things at home? And for most people, they couldn't really use them anyway. But this, this changes. What do you do if you haven't got the technical know-how to build and operate one of those complicated kits? In 1977, three American companies, Commodore, Apple and Tandy, each released a ready-made home computer with keyboards, connectors, even screens in the case of this Commodore PET you can see up here, all built in. These are very neat sort of very ready produced appliances. People can just buy them, plug them in, switch them on and start computing. Not the case before. The problem is they are pretty expensive. Bear in mind that Britain is going through something of a recession at the time in the 1970s. We have serious problems just keeping the lights on in some years. It costs about £700 for an Apple II in the late 1970s. That's roughly the same price as a second-hand car. Um, so at the end of the 1970s, I think computing is still very much restricted to those who are really enthusiastic or have got a lot of money or a lot of technical skills. But that changes with these machines in the 1980s. A new breed of computer that offered the ease of use of the appliances but with the lower cost of the hobbyist machines, and aimed not just at geeky hobbyists, but really at the mass market. And this, that is the home computer, of which you can see two prominent examples here. The first is the ZX80 down the bottom, and its slightly younger brother, the ZX81. And arguably the most important company in getting this new concept off the ground, I think, is probably Sinclair Research, which is a small electronics company based here in Cambridge, and owned by Clive Sinclair. Sinclair are a pretty interesting company with a track record in innovation in both hobbyist electronics kits and consumer appliances. One of their first big successes was one of the first affordable pocket calculators in the early 1970s. And they've got something of a mania for making things small and trying to do more with less. Always trying to create smaller, cheaper, more innovative products. Now it must be said that one or two of these products have a slight reputation for being a little bit 
A BBC journalist once told me, didn't they, weren't they all a bit shonky? And I think that's a pretty good word sometimes. They are a little bit eccentric in some cases. There are lots of design compromises in these things. In the 1970s, they make a digital watch, which is said to run at different speeds depending on how warm the weather is, and has a slight tendency to have its electronics scrambled by the static off a polyester shirt. Not to mention calculators that allegedly suffer from batteries that could explode. For those of you who follow the tech news, the Samsung Galaxy Note 7, which has been in the news so much recently as the exploding smartphone, is just the latest in a long, proud series of electronic gizmos that spontaneously combust. I joke here, but at the same time, for all these reliability issues, Sinclair is an undeniably inventive company with a genius for cost reductions and innovative products and in marketing. And as you can see, the ZX80 here, it really isn't much to look at. It's a small, simple machine with just one kilobyte of memory. That's about half a side of A4 to hold all your program and your data in. It's got a display that flickers on and off as it's actually computing things because it can't do a display and compute at exactly the same time. The keyboard, as you can see, is basically just a piece of flat plastic with some buttons painted on. And if you look closely, you'll see these little heating grills at the top. This isn't, these aren't sort of heating grills at all. These are just stickers meant to look like heating grills. <laughs> but it costs just £100. Despite looking like an overgrown calculator, this is in fact a complete computer for £100. And that's incredible when you consider how much computers were just a few years before this. The following year, Sinclair go one better, and they release an improved version, the ZX81, which you can see here, and I think is probably one of the most important consumer products ever wrapped up in this strikingly futuristic looking black case. I interviewed Rick Dickinson a few years ago, who was Sinclair's industrial designer, who basically was responsible for the look and feel of these products. And he was absolutely fascinating to talk to because he helped me realize how really innovative this all actually was at the time. One of the biggest problems he told me was basically deciding what this thing was going to look like. How are people going to interact with it? Where is it going to go in the home? There was nothing else really around to base what a home computer should look like. So we had to make it up. And we ended up with something that looked a bit like a stylish overgrown calculator, but which I think is gloriously beautiful at the same time. And it's also a masterpiece of inventive minimalism here inside the case. There are just four microchips driving this thing, where most other computers have got dozens. And this allows Sinclair to cut the price down even more. And as it begins selling in huge numbers, it's probably the machine that kickstarts the home computing boom in Britain more than any other. It's also about the first machine you can just wander in and buy on the high street in any numbers when Smith starts selling them in 1981 for Christmas. Hot on the heels of Sinclair come a lot of other computers. Some that are American imports, like the Atari 800 and Commodore VIC-20. Others are developed in Britain, like the Acorn Atom, developed here in Cambridge, and the Grundy New Brain. But they are, for the most part, so very, very different in design. I mean, those of you who've wandered around this computing museum's galleries will have seen this in spades. There are so many machines in there that just look so weird and different. And I think this is a really interesting period. There's no standardization at this point. There's no set idea of what a home computer should look like or what it should do. It's a bit like the early days of aeroplanes, if you like. It's say in about 1910, when aeroplane designers have just about figured out you need wings and an engine, but haven't really figured out where you put the wings and the engine to actually get the thing to take off the ground properly. And until they've crashed a few of their earlier flying machines, then they're not quite going to get the design right. And 1980s computers probably crash even more than 1910s aeroplanes, for that matter. But however different all these different machines actually look like, they're all trying to do something very similar. And that's turn the computer into a domestic appliance for everybody. Remember how weird and mysterious computers were a few, day, a few years before? Designers and marketers of these new home computers tried really hard to carve out a niche for their products in the home by presenting them as user-friendly showing them in domestic environments. So with Sinclair, you see this wonderful phrase, inside a day, you'll be talking to it like a new friend. And if you go through the text of these adverts, they are full of comforting little phrases like, cuts away computer mystique, comes complete with manual that will tell you everything you need to know. However, my absolute favorite 1980s adverts are undoubtedly the family scenes. If you're advertising a home computer in the 1980s, it was almost an unwritten law essential that you have a cuddly image of a family sitting around computing as a family together. 
Um, interestingly enough, I've always been amazed by how much this guy who's advertising Sinclair looks exactly like this guy advertising Acorn. Um, I'm not sure this is sort of computer advertising bigamy or what, but it's incredible. All these images look very much alike because the companies that are always doing this are trying to do the same thing. They're trying to present the computer as something for the home in a way it's never really been done before. But whenever I see these images of these families stuck in front of their computers, I wonder, what are they actually doing with them? Or well, to put it another way, what's a home computer actually for in the early 1980s? And the funny thing is, nobody really knows at first. Um, I've talked to a lot of people who were around from that time, and they don't really, they can never really give you a clear answer who they were designing this thing for. The sorts of things people had used computers for in the past, payroll, designing hydrogen bombs, whatever, they're not the sort of thing you're ever really going to want to do at home. The sorts of things we use computers for in the home today, word processing, sending email, these are uses that are very much in their infancy at the time. They're sort of uses that are waiting to become established as the thing we use computers for in the home. And if you ask the designers of what these early computers, what they thought the computers would actually be used for, they're often very, very vague. One told me it was his job to design them, but up to marketing to figure out why anybody would want to buy one. Another noted he'd never even crossed his mind to think what people would do with these computers. And I think that's fair enough. Most of these people are struggling to try and get them work in a very short time scale. The adverts, though, they always stress that computers are incredibly versatile for all sorts of things. But they're always a bit vague. Sinclair's ZX81 was advertised as being able to do everything from playing chess to running a power station, which is absolutely incredible. But incredibly vague at the same time. At the time, the most common suggestions for what a computer would actually do in the home included storing recipes, just like the good old kitchen computer, cataloguing your stamp collection, educating your children, solving your Rubik's Cube, maybe playing games, but maybe not, or how about a data bank for your telephone numbers? It feels an awful lot like a machine that is trying to find a purpose. And if you flick through software adverts of the time, there are all manner of unlikely uses people are selling software for, of which you will see one or two of my favourites on this screen. This is biorhythms. You enter in your date of birth, and it tells you what your body's circadian rhythms are and how you should be feeling on any particular day. It's also a fantastic way of demonstrating how computers can do graphs. I've always thought this isn't really a coincidence. Or there's this lovely little series of adverts down here for an assortment of home software including well, my absolute favourite programme, which I've never actually tried but really should, Decision Maker from Gemini Software, advertised here as being able to help you decide what car to buy and which woman to marry. <laughs> as if anybody who's bought Decision Maker would actually ever be in a position where they had a choice of who to marry. <laughs> but just in case they did, Gemini Software have what comes next, which is Recipe File. Let all those computer widows have a bash. The wives will really enjoy the fun of this programme designed to keep all her recipes. Excellent value. Computers' gender problems, as I pointed out, continue. Um, but yet, while the computer itself is trying to figure out what on earth it's doing in the home and people are dabbling with using computers for all sorts of purposes, if you look at the surveys, the single biggest reason why people bought a home computer at the start of the 1980s was to figure out what on earth a home computer was. It was to learn about computers, to understand how they worked, to learn programming. And lurking in the background of these adverts are all the time are the hopes and the fears of an apparently looming information technology revolution. People were told that computers were going to be the next big thing, but they were going to have to learn about them. And if they didn't, there wasn't going to be a place for them in the shiny new electronic future. They were going to be left behind. And computer marketers, I think, were wonderfully clever at sort of stoking up some of these fears, always reminding people that the best way to get ready for the future was to buy a Sinclair or a Commodore or an Acorn or whatever. Parents were virtually emotionally blackmailed into buying machines for their children to help with their education. Um, I'm just going to read you one little snippet from an advert, which is from a Dragon 32 computer from 1983, which reads, you knew it would happen one day. Someday, your child will become smarter than you. <laughs> what you didn't expect was that it would happen so soon. <laughs> to you, computers are a mystery from the future. But to your children, they're a real source of excitement. And they're happening now. Buy a Dragon 32 or else. <laughs> 
It seems a little strange to imagine now, but the expectation at the time was very much that people would be programming for themselves. They haven't really got much choice. There isn't a software industry at the start of this in a, in a meaningful way as well. But home computers were very much designed to allow anybody to learn to program. I mean, if you've ever sort of spent any time really analysing the design of these things and what they actually do, a lot of similarities. They're all designed with the programming language BASIC built in. And in fact, the first thing you see when you switch most of them on is a little BASIC prompt. You know, it's not inviting you to start a programme, it's inviting you to start programming. Programming your own computer was a really big deal at the start of the 1980s. Across the country, new computer owners stayed up late, staring at their screens, typing in commands, trying to get their fantastic creations to work, and then getting frustrated when the syntax error message came up when it inevitably didn't. There's a publishing boom that happens as dozens of books and magazines full of programs for you to type in yourselves. A lot of you are smiling and nodding as I'm saying this. They start appearing. You know, magazines like Sinclair User here are basically full of type-in programs for you to sit down and tap in yourself. This is my all-time favourite magazine cover, by the way. It's Sinclair User from 1983, and it stars a Morris Dancer holding a ZX81. I have spent a long time trying to work out what this image means. I've even gone to talk to art historians about it. And the best thing we can sort of come up is the idea that perhaps it's basically showing that in the 1980s, computing is now for everyone even Morris dancers. <laughs> it must be said that a lot of the programs you can type in yourself don't do very much. Maybe they add up some numbers or they display some pretty patterns, but a lot of the time they don't even work. But making people fix bugs in software is a good way of actually educating them about computing. It's all part of the fun. And if you spend some time talking to people about their early programming experience in the 1980s, there's often a sort of subtext of exploration. They all sort of talk about this thing in the same sort of way. It was a bit frustrating, sometimes spending hours hunting for these bugs, but it was really interesting too. There's sort of an intellectual <laughs> stimulating logic puzzle there that people could lose themselves in for hours. It's kind of like electronic Sudoku, I sometimes think. And what they're doing is sort of learning what this machine does. There's something quite magical as well, I think, about being able to buy a machine that you take home and you plug into a television and something happens. That means absolutely nothing today, but 1982 Britain, there's only three TV channels and hardly anyone's got a video recorder. That's basically magic. <laughs> there's also something quite empowering, I think, about learning to program. Think back to those ideas of coming information technology revolution, computers are going to take over the world. Learning to program gives you control of the computer. It means you are not going to be controlled by it, you will be the one controlling it. And computer literacy is a really big deal in the 1980s. The BBC famously launched a massive computer literacy project to educate the nation with books, helplines, television programmes watched by millions of people. And of course, their very own home computer, designed very much with education in mind. Um, hands up who actually remembers the BBC Micro from school? Yeah. I'm absolutely delighted to see we've got some of them in the room here. I mean, it makes me feel a little bit old to see these things in museums, and I'm only in my 30s, but they're wonderful. And they're built so much with education in mind. You know, I mean, when you break down the design of these things and get, I guess, a little bit more geeky, you realise how incredibly flexible they are as educational tools. The basic is sort of customised to make it much more valuable as an educational product than a lot of other home computing basics. It's got interfaces to plug all manner of things into so you can experiment with it. And it's, it's a solidly built middle-class Volvo of a computer for parents who care about their children's education. It's a bit pricey, £400, but it's incredible. And Acorn designed the prototype in just a week. It, yeah, it was a very busy week, apparently. I mean, I spoke to... The lead designers of this thing were Sophie Wilson and Steve Ferber, and they both tell this lovely story about getting a phone call on sort of Sunday night from Acorn boss Herman Hauser, essentially telling both of them that the other has said it's possible to design this computer in a week. Um, and both of them saying, well, it's impossible, but if the other person thinks it is possible, then it probably will give it a go, go on. Um, and that's basically how they des design it in a week. Incredible. But driven by this idea of an information technology revolution, there's a really sort of political government context to this too. And it's very easy to look back with fond nostalgia, I think, on these quirky little machines called home computers. But compared to more modern gizmos today, they are so very, very quaint. But within the political context of the time, there is a very serious point to them. Margaret Thatcher's Tory government, which comes to power in 1979, are very much fans of the home computer. To many kids, it may have been that fun thing for playing Space Invaders with, but to the Tories, it's a way of creating a new entrepreneurial Britain. 
and the start of a new high-tech economy. And driven by this idea of an information revolution, the government believed that if people learned about computers, they would create new business opportunities, there'd be new sorts of jobs. A sort of post-industrial economy would eventually emerge, where people would work in front of computers rather than on factory production lines. Which is just as well, as Thatcherism would close a lot of the factories over the next few years, but that's another argument anyway. My absolute favourite advert from this time is for Acorn Computers, featuring a bunch of unemployed teenagers who found brighter futures through learning about computing. I'm just going to read you a short excerpt. It's a wonderful piece. At the age of 16, these kids found themselves with two options. They could continue at school or join the doll and risk going nowhere on £23 a week. Taking the second option led them to a third, the chance of an education in computers. They didn't have to burden the state much longer. The opening of computer businesses around the country is another little aspect of this. It's, it's seen as a really important thing, a new high-tech economy booming. And the best example of this is undoubtedly the Dragon 32, the family computers of Fire Your Imagination, which was built in my hometown of Port Talbot in South Wales. Port Talbot, best known then as now as a steelmaking town. Um, it's home to an enormous steelworks. But for a time in the early 1980s, it seemed that this would be the machine that dragged Wales into the 20th century with a futuristic alternative to dying heavy industry and mining. Silicon South Wales Valley was not yet to be, unfortunately, but it's still a sort of lovely piece to look back and wonder. Because of things like this, the government became a huge promoter of information technology in the early 80s. They funnel millions of pounds into schemes to teach everybody from business leaders to the unemployed about computers. 1982 is declared the year of information technology, marked with events around the country. There are even stamps. And there's a huge push on computer education in schools. The Micros in Schools scheme from 1982 aimed to give every British, computer, every British school one computer. Another world entirely. But those of us who are old enough to remember the good old BBC micro from school and all those happy hours spent playing Granny's Garden on it, I don't think at the tender age of seven ever considered for a moment that those things were there to basically condition us to be future work units in the capitalist economy of the future. But that's what they are for. In his memoirs, Kenneth Baker, the Minister of Information Technology at the time, Britain has a Minister of Information Technology for more or less the first time at the start of the 1980s, that's how seriously they're actually considering it at the time. They've made a minister for it. Described all these education schemes as educating the children of today for the jobs of tomorrow. Very familiar phrase that we still hear today. And as we sit in front of our computers at work today, that is to a huge extent what has happened. There's also an element of propaganda here too. The success of small enterprising computer firms and their millionaire owners was a powerful example of the sort of entrepreneurial Britain that Thatcher claimed she was trying to create. Thatcher herself even talked about home computers in her speeches, in 1982 declaring, we must allow private endeavour to flourish. We must let the vision of the entrepreneur, the flair of the businessman, create the wealth and jobs of tomorrow. The development of the cheap home microcomputer is the outstanding example. She even gave the Japanese Prime Minister a Sinclair ZX Spectrum as a present <laughs> to show how incredible British technology was. And thanks to the wonder of YouTube, we can show you that moment. <laughs> This is a small home computer. You press that button and it's just Of course, the government may have hoped that home computers would create all sorts of interesting new jobs and new business opportunities, but they probably weren't expecting that one of the biggest and most important would be video games. It's often said that nobody really expected that home computers would get used for video games. That's not really true. Of course, the designers knew that people would play around with games on their machines. What they weren't really expecting was the extent to which video games would not just be one of those many things that you would do with a home computer, but actually become a thing in its own right. In fact, the main thing that you do with a home computer. Now, of course, there were video games before the home computer. The 1970s had brought such wonders as coin-op machines, Atari video games consoles, and Pong television games. And I've discovered today that the computer, the computer museum here actually has a new gallery demonstrating this, which you may want to look at later. But while all these things, I think, were wondrous at the time and caught the imagination, as a games playing experience, they're actually pretty rubbish. They're packaged entertainment experiences with simple games and ideas. 
And there's no worse example, I think, than Pong, which is, I think, pretty much the quintessential 1970s video game. At first, it's fun enough, extraordinary when there's little better to compare it to, but basically, you're hitting around a small square on a screen with a couple of rectangles. There's not much going on there. The more advanced Pong consoles, you may note, actually offer other games as well. They offer things like hockey, squash, tennis, football, all basically variations of knocking around a small square ball on a screen with some rectangles. Home computers are nothing like this, I think. They're not like a car arcade machines or consoles. They don't just allow people to play pre-packaged things, but they allow them to create them. Very quickly, that's what people start to do. In homes across Britain, bedroom programmers, many of them only teenagers, start writing games and selling them through mail order, setting up their own little companies. And gradually, this whole new industry, which no one had really foreseen, emerges. Apparently driven entirely by teenage millionaires driving Porsches, but that's, that's to some extent a creation of the games industry, which had an eye for marketing even in its very, very early days. Now, at first, the games, they are pretty crude. And a lot of them tend to borrow from existing sorts of games. There are more versions of computer chess, Space Invaders, and Pac-Man than you would think possible. I know, I've tried to count them and given up. But gradually, something interesting happens as people start experimenting around a little bit. They learn their programming tricks and their techniques, and they start getting ideas for new sorts of games. And I think the early 1980s are probably the most creative period in the history of video games. For a few years, anybody with a home computer can make a video game. There are so few expectations or precedents of what a game should actually be. And there are no barriers to entry either. You don't need a million dollars to market a computer game. You just need an idea, a ZX81 and a bunch of blank tapes. Maybe a tenner for an advert at the back of Sinclair user. And that's got you into the games industry. It must be said that because of these reasons, a lot of the games from this time are absolutely awful. Um, and I think perhaps best forgotten. But out of this creative milieu also comes some incredibly creative titles. And I could spend hours just talking about 1980s video games. There are thousands upon thousands of them. But let's just choose one or two that I think demonstrate the incredible creativity by games programmers in this time. Working within very tight technical constraints and working with new ideas. I think the most impressive standout title from this first crop of games is 3D Monster Maze which, if I press a button, may actually start playing. Excellent. Created in 1982 by an engineer called Malcolm Evans. Forget Pac-Man running round his silly two-dimensional mazes, guzzling pills and dodging some wibbly ghosts. Monster Maze is survival horror, rendered in three dimensions. The suspense of T-Rex lying in wait. The mounting dread of approaching footsteps. The desperate, <laughs> desperate race away from this lumbering beast. And the keyboard controls are laid out in such a terrible way. All the buttons are next to each other. You can't find the one that goes forward or back or left or right. And eventually, the awful happens. <laughs> I think the mark of a good game is the fact that it's still good decades later. 3D Monster Maze was created in 1982. That's nearly 35 years ago. And it's still terrifying to play today. Malcolm Evans, who, who bought this thing, I mean, I'll just give you a little bit of the backstory because it's, it's to some extent a little familiar to other computer games from this time. As Malcolm told the story to me, he started off, like so many others, by thinking, what the hell do I do with this machine, which my wife has bought me for my birthday? Before starting off on this process of exploration, of exploring what it could do, programming it to make a maze, realising he could make it appear you're walking around the maze, and then, without having really set off to make a game in the first place, added a terrifying dinosaur. It's incredible, really. I mean, this thought of this process of exploration, which happens so much in this time. Now, the ZX81's successor is, of course, the ZX Spectrum, which is released in 1982. And this will be even more of a games machine than a good old ZX81. Because, the Sinclair's, because Sinclair's designers knew that gaming had been popular on Sinclair's earlier machines, they made this key decision to add colour basically to make it a bit more attractive for playing games on. But entertainment was supposed to be just part of what it did. Originally, it was marketed as a general purpose machine, the most powerful computer for under £500, according to the adverts. But very quickly, this huge culture of gaming develops around it, essentially swamping any educational aspirations it may have originally had. 
but coming up with some incredibly fun and innovative titles. Things like Manic Miner, for instance, developed by a Merseyside teenager named Matthew Smith. This game is absurdly difficult, like so many others of that time. It's this madcap quest through a surreal world of killer telephones and mutant, tele uh, and mutant penguins. And it's probably one of the first games that actually has backing music. That's how new things are at the time. But for me, alongside games like Manic Miner, the really sort of inventive games are things like these, the isometric 3D games. I mean, back in 1982, Manic Miner was basically hailed as being absolutely incredible for having squeezed 20 of these screens into one Spectrum game. A few years later, John Rittman creates this wonderful piece, which is Head Over Heels. And it's this rich 3D environment, 3D gameplay, 3D moves, 3D pieces, with 150 screens squeezed into exactly the same computer. I think the sort of testament to how well games programmers actually developed over this time is clear when you start looking at these intricate worlds they managed to create inside the machines. But the other thing that stands out to me looking back at this is how much art reflects culture. And I've always been struck, really, how much 1980s society gets reflected in video games in ways which I don't think are necessarily the case today. For instance, there are all sorts of unlikely scenarios. Wanted Monty Mole, for example, is a game based on the 1984 miners' strike, where you pay a, miner, sorry, a mole who's off to get some coal from Arthur Scargill. <laughs> Dennis Sue the Drinking Glass is a text adventure game where you play Dennis Thatcher, trying to escape Margaret. <laughs> Navigate your way through 10 Downing Street and find a gin and tonic. <laughs> and my all-time favourite of the... There's a whole series of absolutely awful television tie-in games over this time as well for all manner of television programmes. The Archers even has its own video game, That's, which is radio, I know. But my absolute favourite of this whole batch is Auf Wiedersehen Pet. Does anyone remember Auf Wiedersehen Pet? It's about a bunch of unemployed Geordies who end up going to Germany. Or Vida Zane Pet gives you the chance to play a Geordie brick builder building a wall in Dusseldorf. <laughs> it's a very experimental time for the video game. It's a time when the computer game is trying to figure out what it is and what it's doing. And while much of the gaming innovation is on the spectrum, simply because there are so many of them and they're so cheap and so accessible, it wouldn't really be right to sort of conclude this section without briefly mentioning Elite, which is probably the most impressive of the early crops of games. Now, this was created in Cambridge by two Cambridge students, David Brabham and Ian Bell, in 1984. Working in the even smaller 32K memory of the BBC Micro, the pair created a radically new sort of game, I think. You know, it's a blend of space shooter, trading, exploration, played out across a vast universe of over 2,000 planets. 2,000 planets in a 32K computer, it's, it's absolutely extraordinary all realised in what were, for the time, incredible three-dimensional graphics. And it's so free. This is a whole universe you can just go out and explore. There's no plot to be followed. Think back to Pac-Man, trapped forever, running around his two-dimensional maze. It seems so cruel and so limited compared to the enormity of just being able to go out there in this surreal, made-up universe inside a box and explore. And it went far beyond, I think, what the designers of the BBC Micro thought was possible. Now, people often look upon the home computer as being a technology that failed. They ask, why am I using a PC today and not some souped-up version of the ZX Spectrum or the Acorn? Where did all these machines go? And games are a little part of the answer of that, I think. The development of the games industry had a profound impact on the fortunes of the home computer. As people started playing games and more and more, the home computer stopped being this wonder machine that was going to educate people about computers and teach them programming. That idea begins to fade. Most people stopped programming for themselves and just bought cassette tapes and discs of ready-made software. As they began to get used to computers, they didn't need beginner's machines anymore. So cheap computers began to be looked on as a bit of a toy, not helped by the fact the games industry is marketing them as just that. Something fun to play games on, but not very serious computers in a way they were a couple of years previously. Gradually, people start turning to more powerful machines that seem like real computers. And it's at just this moment that Amstrad come on the scene, when Amstrad boss Alan Sugar decided that rather than making pregnant calculators of the type that he referred to Sinclair computers as being, he'd start making machines that looked like real computers. 
Alan Sugar's idea of a real computer was apparently the type that people would see at travel agents when they were booking their holidays. Um, but also at the same time, they were very sort of clever about marketing their machines in ways that showed them as both serious but also fun. Thus we have this businessman here who looks alarmingly like Bill Gates doing accounts, projections, word processing and 180 miles an hour. It's very much the idea of a general purpose computer. And Amstrad really have the right concept at the right time. They're easy to use machines, but rather than just sell you one little box like Sinclair had done to plug into your TV, they sold you an entire computer, you know, the monitor, the printer as well, the disk drive, all in a couple of boxes. It's an enormously neat consumer product. And Amstrad were hugely successful at this. I think we sometimes forget this because as Amstrad come on the market in 1984, the computer market, the home computer market at least, has started to fade. The fad kind of comes to an end. Computer companies start going bankrupt and the huge diversity of the early 1980s, it starts to die off. After the huge sales of Christmas 1983 when there literally aren't enough computers to go around, the manufacturers go crazy over 1984 trying to make as many as they can and crumb Christmas 1984 nobody wants them. Um, companies are literally left with warehouses full of stock they can't get rid of and the only way to get rid of it is to cut the prices. Essentially, over 1985, things get worse and worse, and by 1986, even Sinclair are getting out of the computer business by selling up to Amstrad. In general, the market turns to a new breed of personal computer. More expensive, advanced machines like the Atari ST, the Commodore Amiga, and the Acorn Archimedes, along with the very boring IBM standard PC you see here. Still just as boring in 1981 as it is 25, 30 years later but which was starting on this path that was really sort of taking it out of offices and going into people's homes, gradually pushing out all this diversity. And unlike the old home computers, and I think this is the real fundamental difference, these aren't machines built to be explored. They are machines where you just buy the software and you just run it. Now, the old home computer really should have died just there, but it didn't. A few survivors struggled on. All those BBC micros, some of us remember from schools, they're still there in the 1990s. Machines like the Commodore 64, the ZX Spectrum, found pretty sort of active retirements as games machines. They were still building them in the early 1990s, uh, by which time the design's basically a decade old. That's incredible for any technology product today, I think. But with the eventual demise of these machines, it's tempting to write them off as being a failure, a cul-de-sac in the history of technology, if you like. But personally, I think they were phenomenally successful. They were intended to take computers out of the realm of science fiction and to make them everyday technologies, things that were familiar to all of us. That people didn't want computers of this type at home anymore doesn't really mean that they failed at all. It's not a sign of failure, but of huge success. In the big scheme of things, they created the computer literate society we live in today, where we accept electronic brains around us all the time as being perfectly normal. And yet there's something else about 1980s computing that's never really quite gone away. Retro computing, I think, has become huge. There are countless websites you can go to, countless products you can buy that celebrate 1980s computing. I own retro mugs, retro t-shirts, retro art. I mean, there's a whole industry out there supplying this stuff now. People still create games for machines that haven't been produced in 30 years. You can join vintage computer clubs. You can come to fantastic places like this that keep home computing alive or you could buy a Raspberry Pi. 20 quid cheap computer designed in Cambridge and released in 2012, very much with that same idea, that 1980s idea, of coming up with a machine that allowed people to program for themselves, to explore, learn coding, I think they call it in this day and age, get to get people being creative with computers once again. And within the Raspberry Pi, oddly enough, there is another legacy of the home computing boom. It's powered by an ARM chip an advanced type of low-powered mic low microprocessor developed by the same people who actually designed the BBC Micro back in the 1980s. So within all those Raspberry Pis is a little tiny slice of the BBC Micro. And it's not just the BBC Micro because ARM chips are absolutely everywhere. They built something like 50 billion of them. They're even inside your iPhone, your central heating system. All these are basically running on the great-great-grandchild of the BBC Micro. And as many of you will have seen, our news over the last few years has been absolutely filled with talk of another looming information technology revolution. Computers are coming once again to take all our jobs once again. 
we're going to have to adapt once again, or that's it, we're finished. Nobody really seems to know what all this is going to mean, but as a historian, I'd like to leave you with one final thought. We've been here before. These are the same things we heard about microchips in the 1970s, about information technology in the 1980s. It's probably the same thing the Victorians were talking about with steam engines. Technologies change, but the threats and the opportunities they bring, they seem to remain the same. Maybe this is history repeating itself, or maybe we're still actually living in the 1980s home computing boom, or its latter echoes. I don't really know, but I'm going to leave you with that thought. And if you've enjoyed this, you might want to check out my new book. <laughs> Electronic Dreams, How 1980s Britain Learned to Love the Computer. Available from all good bookshops, including the one here. And if you buy one tonight, I'll even sign it. And I think we've still got some time for questions, haven't we? Thank you all for listening. <laughs>